Today, I'm going to talk to you exclusively about Supplemental Security Income, or SSI. I always call it Social Security Income, but that's not the right name. It's Supplemental Security Income, and it's discriminatory practices. Um, I'm qualified to speak on this topic because I was awarded SSI in 2019. I suffer from debilitating intractable chronic pain with really no end in sight. So I know to you I look fine, but my back hurts right now, I'm just saying. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer anything, or any curiosities you might have about what's going on with me after the talk or anytime, really. Um, so first of all, what is SSI? Supplemental Security Income, or SSI, is a federal program that provides monthly payments to people who have limited income and few resources. SSI is for people who are 65 or older, as well as for those in, of any age, including children who are blind or have disabilities. When most people think of discrimination against persons with disabilities. They think of restaurants and stores not having proper installations like ramps, doorways, and bathroom stalls. But did you know that there are other serious issues that mainstream people and even some healthcare professionals don't know about? When I explained what I'm about to tell you to my therapist, she was shocked and I thought, why does it seem like nobody knows about this information? On one hand, SSI provides monthly cash assistance to nearly 8 million older and disabled people with very low incomes. On the other hand, it is extremely difficult to apply for and be awarded Social Security income. And if you're one of the lucky applicants who are awarded SSI, you soon realize that you've become caught in a poverty trap. So in the 70s, when SSI was created, policymakers set an asset limit of $1,500 a month per individual and $2,250 a month per couple. In the 80s, the asset limit of persons receiving SSI was raised to $2,000 per individual or $3,000 per couple. This asset limit raise allowed people to set aside money for emergencies or a bill that needed to be paid and other expenses. Yeah. <laughs> oh no! Wow. Okay, look, I got most of this information from the official SSIGov.gov website. The site sucks. It's hard to navigate through so much information that would then have links to click that branched out would start me down another rabbit hole uh, looking at another topic that was really important to know about too. So what are assets? Assets include cash, bank accounts, retirement savings, stocks, mutual funds, saving bonds, savings bonds, life insurance, household goods, and anything else you own which could be changed to cash and used for food or shelter, as well as the resources of parents, spouses, and immigration sponsors in many cases, and more. The value of your home if you live in it, and usually the value of one car is not counted. Lucky us. Um, also not counted, your medical assistance, assistance devices like wheelchairs, canes, crushes, crutches, walkers, grab bars, hospital beds, oxygen, oxygen therapy devices, and other equipment you might need as a disabled person. But the thing is, if your medical equipment's value is over $2,000, you are allowed to own them. But if you have to save up $2,000 to buy them, you could get kicked off your assistance and get a large portion, and a large portion of the disabled community will have well over $2,000 in healthcare costs alone. Um, a major issue with this incredibly unreasonable asset limit has to do with um, the ability to marry. On the Social Security website, it says that if you get married, your SSI payment amount may change as a result of your new spouse's income and resources. But if you're cohabitating without being married, you are guaranteed a higher income level and generally fare better financially than married couples and individuals living alone. Really the truth is, is that if you're on supplemental security, uh, 
income program, you can't get married because your spouse's income will then put you over the limit of eligibility and you'll be suspended then terminated from the program. And if you have children who, in the household who work, their income counts too. So the whole household's income then you're not allowed to have more than $2,000 if you're just applying on your own. So really the truth is, is if uh, the disabled community is the last marginalized group in America that cannot get married due to an archaic policy, and that needs to change ASAP. So you could even have a part-time job on SSI. If you are working the amount of money you can earn is up to 1550 a month or 2590 a month if you're blind. Under $400 a week for most people. If you earn more than that, you likely won't qualify for benefits. But if you're feeling well enough to work, even if it's a few hours a month, you must report your earnings and they will deduct everything you made except for $20 from your next benefits check. What the hell, right? If you don't report your earnings, you can get kicked out of the SSI program and made to repay the overage amount that they gave you. Well, paper, how much, do, how much does the SSI pay you? How much do you get? What's on your check? Um, the SSI website says that payment amounts increase with the cost of living. But it's impossible to save money because you're not allowed to have more than $2,000 to $3,000 at any given time or you could lose your benefits. If you're on SSI, you could never build wealth, save for emergencies, and it would ensure that you would live in poverty. So why would someone try to get on SSI, right, if you're disabled? It's because along with a monthly payment, you get health insurance that you wouldn't otherwise receive. I have Medicare, and that's normally given to people 65 and older. If you are sick or have a disability, you will probably be going to the doctor a lot, right? Um, so, so wait, they monitor your bank account, want to make sure it never like, gets over? A they will. You have to give them all of that information. And feel free to ask questions and interrupt me so I can answer for you. So it's, it's a risk. It's a risk, um, yeah. There is a growing recognition among federal policymakers that asset limits need to be updated. This is what's being done right now, because like, you're like, well, what, what are we gonna do about it? What are we doing, right? Um, there is a proposal called the SSI Savings Penalty Elimination Act, which would raise the program's asset limits from $2,000 to $10,000 for an individual, and from $3,000 to $20,000 for couples, respectively. While it has bipartisan support in both the Senate and the House, it remains to be seen how far lawmakers may be able to push the proposal. Even the Social Security Advisory Board's statement on the Supplemental Security Income Programs suggest that the asset cap is too low. They say, and I quote, it's time for Congress to consider reviewing some aspects of the SSI program. More than 35 years after its enactment, the program is operating in a world that has changed and with a beneficiary population that is much different. New analytical tools and data are available that were not available through 35 years ago and could be useful to review the program. So even they know, even SSI knows that it's messed up. So now, what do we do now? For now, disabled people sit and wait and try to survive, barely making enough money to live in today's economy. And I personally don't understand how the Social Security Administration expects people to abide by all of their almost impossible rules and regulations and limitations. Their application is intimidating and there are so many people living not only with a disability and or chronic pain, but also things like PTSD. In 2019, when I applied for SSI, I was right out of college and prepared to do the difficult work of filing with their application, filling out their, out their application and collecting and organizing a list of every doctor's appointment and blood test. And at the time, I was able to be very organized because according to the SSI fact sheet, Processing an application for disability benefits can take three to six months. 
So this is some of the info you need to collect in order to apply for SSI. This is just some of it. One of my dearest friends said that every time she opens the website, she sobs because it's hard enough fighting every day to get out of bed and do what she needs to do just to live. And she doesn't have the spoons to start another project. If you have questions about spoons, please ask. Um, the application is so daunting that she feels like she's halfway up a mountain struggling. And to try to apply for SSI is like putting another mountain range in front of her. The entire process is intimidating and triggering. Another good friend said, they made my mom jump through hoops while I was basically a vegetable. She had to appeal three times. She did not live to see me get my benefits, finally. And I'm not saying that I'm not grateful for the little bit of cash that I'm allotted or that it isn't helpful, but when people's basic needs are met, they thrive. Well, right now we're not thriving, we're just out here surviving. Um, it was difficult for me to write this little talk. Doing all the research and digging into the world of SSI led me into stopping fits of my own. It is so painful to know that thousands of people with disabilities are struggling just to make it in an unfair system. It also makes me feel small and a little ashamed to be stuck in this horrible cycle built to keep me in poverty. One of my favorite TikTok influencers influencers, Mrs. Had says, no one is immune to sickness, injury, or age. There's no reason we can't do better. Thanks.